All right, hey, hey y'all. Uh, today I'm with Curtis, and we're going to be talking about uh, the, the Losing Guitars Thousand Plateaus, specifically the 13th Plateau, 7000 BC, Apparatus of Capture. Now, before we get into that, Curtis, why don't you tell me a bit about yourself? Like, what do you what do you do? Sure. Um, well, I'm a PhD student um, here at Western. Um, <clears throat> my work um, converges upon a few different lines of thought, um, in including the intersection of metaphysics, uh, philosophy of language, and aesthetics. Primarily, and my dissertation research uh, focuses on a comparative monograph of Deleuze's and Wittgenstein's work, um, specifically in the intersection of metaphysics and philosophy of language, um, and in particular on the notion of sense. Um, but I've had a long-standing interest in this book, which has bewildered many and yeah, perhaps yeah. bored very few, yeah. who t like it or leave it. Um, and um, although I'm certainly not an expert on the book, um, I thought I'd give a, play my hand at talking a little bit about this uh, chapter, the apparatus of capture, because it forms a, a pretty large portion of the political work in this book, um, along with two other plateaus. One, which is a companion piece to this, um, which is the treatise on nomadology. Uh, the War Machine, which directly precedes it. The other one would be um, the politics, uh, micropolitics of segmentarity. Um, but I, th I feel like, although those other two chapters in discussing the politics of a thousand plateaus, or Deleuze and Guattari's work more generally, um, each of those gets a lot of uh, play on their own. Um, this one is generally, I, I, I would say, the sort of um, the forgotten hero, or uh, or at the very least, um, is undersold in relation to those other two pieces of work in this book. Yeah, and I, I got that for the, the first time. I read I read a thousand plateaus. I, for my own part, felt the same way. Like those those did stand out to me, especially the war machine chapter mm -hmm. uh, or plateau. It was something that uh, a general the general thesis of that text is something that did stick with me and it's something that I did retain which is saying quite a bit given the, the degree of content matter in this text to actually say that I, there's there's a specific thing I took out of it would mean that it was pretty important at least in my mind but taking the time now to get into this one like I it makes a lot more sense right so I guess uh, where did I I have a question just to, just to start out I'm why 7000 BC yeah, well, that's a good place to start, I think. Um, I mean, we might want to jump back and sort of contextualize things a bit. But, yeah, please. But I do think it is important. Um, so for those unfamiliar with the Thousand Plateaus, each, uh, each plateau or chapter in the book starts out with a date. They give a sort of rationale for this, but basically um, each date represents a sort of like galvanizing moment about the concept that they're introducing, the primary concept that they're introducing in that, cha in that particular chapter. And um, this chapter, Apparatus of Capture, um, comes with the date 7000 BC. Um, now, like I said, I'm not an expert on the book, so I haven't tracked down every reference, but um, if I were to guess, because a large part of this book centers around um, the historical typology of political formations, um, my guess would be that 7000 BC... Um, is a sort of generic date that stands in for the sort of hypothetical origination of the state apparatus or the or state power. Um, particularly, if I were again to take a stab at it, I would say probably it represents the origin of the Egyptian civilization, which is commonly thought to emerge around 7000 BC. But it could equally be Sumer or the Indus River Valley civilization. Any of these early um, these early um, imperial states that form 
in the Fertile Crescent around that time. Right. So, and I guess from there, uh, thinking about the distinction that they make right off the bat between the two forms of, I guess, I guess governance, mm -hmm. where on one side, you know, and they, they elaborate on them much more as it goes through, but just kind of starting off, we have the two sides being one occupied by the, the, the one-eyed man and then the one-armed man. Yes. Or the, the magic emperor mm -hmm. and the, the Jesuit priest king. Yes. So, and really, I, I, this is going to be a, a learning experience for me, so I'm going to ask some rather naive questions. Mm -hmm. But thinking about this point, 7000 B.C., you know, a very uh, kind of a magical moment, let's say. Is there a shift from one of these systems or one of these modes of governance to another at, right. at, at that point, like hypothetically? or, or Sure. Kind of so a big, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, the plateau introduces um, what they would, what they want to call two poles of the state or two, the two poles of political sovereignty. Um, this they're taking from the work of a comparative mythologist named uh, Georges Dumézil, um, <clears throat> who studies Indo-European myths across different cultures. So he looks at um, he looks at ancient Indian myths. He looks at um, uh, Roman mythology. He looks at the mythology of um, the Nordic peoples and Germanic peoples. Um, and he finds across them that they have myths that function um, to tell a story about political sovereignty and that these center around two different kinds of figures, both of which are necessary um, to sort of constitute political sovereignty. One, as you mentioned, is uh, they call the magician emperor, um, and the other is the jurist priest. Um, both of these figures come to play different functional roles within the state, or they represent these roles. Um, and um, so the, the first role, that of the magician emperor, um, functions by virtue of his, his role as a binder, um, or of his magical use of signs. Um, the jurist priests a uh, king, on the other hand, functions by use of the law and of technology. So he is the builder of legal rights and of institutions, whereas the magician king um, functions by way of um, what they want to call binding or magical capture. Um, this will get flushed out in a lot more detail as the chapter goes on. Yeah. Um, but these are the two poles of the state um, as attested by these ancient myths, and they're going to use these um, to sort of navigate the relationship between um, the, the origin of the state and its relation to different, different kinds of social formations uh, throughout history, and, and then further on down the road how um, this essence that's created by these two poles, which they're calling the apparatus of capture, um, becomes formative for um, the development of surplus value and thus of capital. Um, so like, the, there is a theme that runs this whole book, and, I, and I'll talking about the book more generally, and I'm going to hone it down a little bit, where... Uh, Deleuze and Guattari make disti many distinctions, right? Kind of binary uh, distinctions, where they see present in either or something of the other. Mm -hmm. Like they, they, there's always an element of one that can be found in the other. Yes. With every moment of deterritorialization, there is simultaneously uh, an an equal and opposite territorialization. Right. Perhaps to, to follow <laughs> that and. I think, for my own part, thinking about these two uh, separate entities in these terms helps if we consider the extent to which one of them or in each can be found properties or elements of the other. And it, I just kind of saying that as a sort of uh, a preface that has already, you know, that falls already in the text, at least in our discussion here, but just to kind of lay out um, how we're going to move through this. 
because for me it makes more sense to think about it that way as opposed to seeing these things as being either opposing or totally different in, in every way. But I want to ask you a more uh, specific question then. What is it about thinking about the distinction between the emperor, uh, the magic emperor or the magician emperor mm -hmm. and uh, the Jewish priest? What role does something like, and I'm going to bring in uh, something of an obscure, um, an obscure example from uh, Homer. So in Homer, there's that uh, around the, uh, after the, the games, the uh, Olympic games or the, um, oh my God, of course it's eluding me. But there's a sort of a judicial moment where people are trying to figure out the sort of justice that is going to befall uh, a person. However, that was, at least according to, to someone like Foucault, the first moment that we saw this thing called like justice being enacted, mm -hmm. right? So in that way, because it actually had the properties of this thing called justice, which I think upon reading this would fall into the side of the Juris priest or, or being part and parcel of that element of law mm -hmm. as a new, new thing in itself does it actually mark something of a, of a ritual or, or something that does not abide by the law precisely in its newness so f from there if I can elaborate a little more how do we then lay out what constitutes the mag magician emperor and the, the juris priest right so um Okay, there's a lot of things involved in this yeah, <laughs> question. Yeah, it's said a lot. Um, <clears throat> so if we want to get clear on those two poles, um, they talk uh, pretty extensively about it um, in relation to the war machine um, in the treatise on nomadology, which is the chapter just preceding this. So when you, as you come into the, this chapter on the apparatus of capture, they're sort of assuming that you've gone through the work, even though they tell you in the preface that you can read it out of order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. be misled by yeah. what they say. Yeah. <laughs> Look at what it they do. It helps a lot, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so the treatise on nomadology, to a large extent, um, grounds the work that they're going to do in this chapter. Um, and in particular with relation to the poles of sovereignty, um, that is to say the pole of the magician emperor, uh, these, these two quote-unquote men of state, uh, the magician emperor and the jurist priest, um, these are sort of laid out in that chapter. So by the time we get to this chapter, they're sort of reviewing this because at the beginning of that last chapter, that's what they started with. Um, but to answer your question a little more thoroughly, um, there there is a question of law here um, that that is unique to the state as it is, um, which throughout the book and obviously they take they've taken from a large tradition um, by the point that they're by the point at which they're writing this, but which they're going to call logos more or less. This um, includes a whole lot of things that I'm not going to get into for reasons that will take us too far afield. Um, but essentially, they, um, in, in focusing their attention in this book, they don't want to say that, like, okay, the state represents organization as such or structure as such and that everything outside of it is chaotic or what have you. They they want to continually insist that there are other social formations which which are outside of the state which have their own forms of justice their own pity their own cruelty you know their own problems their own um their own forms of of social organization which constitute even in some cases like more severe social norms um what they really want to talk about with relation to the state apparatus is um, is what it does in relation to these other f social formations, namely so formations like what they come to call the war machine, or formations that you would find in hunter gatherer so um, hunter gatherer societies, or in um, so called primitive peoples. And so that's where they're going to start, um, and they're going to use what they what they understand. Um, through their readings of 
of history, of archaeology, of ethnology or anthropology, and of political economy. They're going to use all of these tools together to try and formulate an idea about what it means um, for the state to capture something and and what that means um, not only in relation to primitive peoples in 7000 BC but also what it means in relation to um, various um, historical formations and up to and including uh, capitalism um, as what they want to call an axiomatic. So, um, I'll ask another question, a more broad one, but I don't want you to be uh, to be restricted to this question. How does it go from you know these two poles to this thing called the state? How 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 does the state come about in relation to that, and what position does it stand in? Mm -hmm. in relation to those two poles? So at the time that they wrote this, this is a really great question. I think it gets at the heart of what they're trying to do in the, in the first half of this chapter. Um, so what I'm, taking, what I'm taking your question to mean is um, a question about how does the state come about and what does it do in relation to these, yeah. and these so-called like uh, primitive or these sort of social formations that exist before the state appears. Right. Does it conjure them away, or does it sort of transpose them, and, right. and, and then they uh, come out in other forms? Yeah. So, um, so the, the basic thesis of the first half of this chapter is, um, at least at the time in which it was written, very controversial in relation to what the traditional narrative about the emergence of the state, which we must remember that in the 20th century and before, um, the state formation was associated with notions of civilization, uh, with notions of civility, with notions of um, social progress in relation to previous uh, social formations. And thus, um, a big part of the justification, historical justification of um, the colonial power in the West was that we had we had a, um, a progressive social formation that was better organized than other kinds of social formations and that therefore we had a right to colonize these other people in virtue of our greater civility or our greater civilization. Um, of course this is nonsense um, but even in the 1980s, in the, or in 1980 when this book came out, this notion would have still held a lot of water. Um, and in particular, if not for the justification of uh, colonialism, it would have held water in the sort of sociological model, the socio-historical models that a lot of the um, scholars involved in this type of research would have sort of tacitly assumed whenever they went to investigate the intersection or the emergence of these things in history. So their, so their um, thesis is a controversial one, and, but it's basically this, um, that the, the progressive developmental model um, of social formations that we've come to understand through the kinds of works that they're talking about, that is to say, that there were at some stage, some very early stage in human history, hunter-gatherers, they used stone tools. At some point they um, developed agriculture um, and domestication of animals to, to the extent that a surplus um, was possible, that is to say that they weren't subsistence farming, right? Or that they weren't just um, foraging for their basic needs that there was some sort of excess available to them. This provided the basis for an, an, e an economic stock, um, and that stock in turn provided the basis for the specialization of labor. And that those things all put together were what was required for um, 
the special functions of the state as a, as the as the producer or author of owners or sorry of organs of power so the jurist priests who are responsible for the creation of the law they're not spending their time farming right they're 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 doing astronomy and they're trying to provide um, ethical codes or codes that govern exchange or marriage rights or religious rights, right? These kinds of things. Um, by the same logic, you have um, a merchant class that emerges out of this, right? And you also have um, a trades class, a class that focuses on manufacture rather than um, the production of food. Um, and from this you get things, although they're going to contest this, if you, if you go back and read um, um, the treatise on nomadology, but it is often assumed that metallurgy is a product, that is to say, the Bronze Age emerge, emerges because of state formations as well. So this is the sort of, like, argument that the classical... Um, archaeologists um, and social historians of l large scale political and social formations would wield. What they're going to argue is that that's not true at all and that the state precedes all of these deve de developments um, that are traditionally associated both with the conditions of possibility of the state and with the things that the state supposedly provides that that weren't possible before it. Um, and this is why they're going to insist on a fundamentally um, parasitic notion of the state um, as something that captures value and redistributes it in various ways. That, that, was, that, was, a, that was a good answer. This is all off the top of his head, by the way. He has no notes. Well, he has the book. <laughs> but I, before I ask you another question, um, where do you where do you want to go from here? What, is is there anything that you think is like a necessary uh, building block to, to grasping this <clears throat> chapter? This yeah, well, time? I guess it depends on how fine grained we're going to get, but um, I mean, I could go into more detail about the sort of general outline that we've just gone through, um, or we could put some of the conceptual scaffolding back onto this that they would like so the lexicon that they're working with and all that sort of thing if some <clears throat> um, listeners are reading this for the first time they might not be able to pick out exactly what I'm talking about through the text because they use a very specialized language that I'm not using right now yeah um, so we could maybe go through some of that and the the war machine might be it might be a decent thing to, yeah. to like because because as you said this is something they really lay out in the chapter that precedes yeah. this mm -hmm. one, but it's a it's a term that otherwise would be rather confusing right. reading this. Yes. Um, okay, so um, it's a difficult concept to sort of gather together in one singular term. I mean, it's easy to gather together in a term, but it's hard to um, explain through just one particular aspect or one lens, what it It's what easy it to misunderstand as well. Mm -hmm. like, so, um, obviously the natural assumption, given the name, is to assume that the war machine is the organ of the state that deals with war, right? So what they would, what they would call the military institution of the state. Uh, but the argument of the, of the treatise on nomadology is that the war machine... Um, is exterior to the state um, in its form even if in our contemporary situation all all war machines that would we, that we would recognize as such are are now functions of the state but what they want to but again it's a similar situation with their argument in apparatus of capture about the emergence of the state they want to look back in history to see um, how things might have functioned at the moment before um, the state had incorporated the, 
form machine as one of its organs. So they want to develop a notion of the war machine, first of all, as essentially exterior to the state, as I said, um, and exterior by virtue of the way that it distributes um, its population and the way it views um, territory, really. <clears throat> so and alongside this notion of the war machine is the notion of deterritorialization and territorialization and re-territorialization, which are among the most important concepts of the book. Um, and really, what differentiates the war machine from the state um, is that, first of all, it views um, distributions of land, say, or of people in a fundamentally different way than the state. The state wants to um, assign roles and spaces um, for things to happen in a particular way. Make them numerable. Yes. Yes, <laughs> make them numerable, exactly. Um, um, and this happens a priori, right? So before the people or the space has a particular function, it gives it that function. Um, and then the and then the people are distributed according to these uh, rules, right? The rules of about the use of space, rules about um, how to how to live in those spaces, rules about what a particular person is supposed to do. So you can think of this in terms of class or caste, right? These are all functions of the state, whereas. Um, what they want to argue is that the war machine is not exclusively um, it's not exclusively tied to its relation to war, but rather that it gets its it gets its character of war by virtue of its relation to the state, either as being in conflict with the state at a particular moment or as being incorporated uh, into the state. And that that function is something that's applied to it, or is something that it takes on as a necessary response to its interaction with the state. But fundamentally, the war machine uh, views itself nomadologically, if, if you want to call it that, or it, um, it doesn't... Um, The functions that the um, elements of the war machine take on aren't pre-inscribed by virtue of um, a central authority in the war machine. And so war as an element or as an aspect or as something that could characterize the war machine is only relative to its interaction with the state, for example, or with some other party in which it's with, with which it's in conflict. Whereas, once it becomes incorporated into the state, um, war becomes its exclusive function um, because that's what, that's what is capturable by virtue of the state, right? That's what is useful to the state, and that's the function that the state is going to insist on the war machine having. Um, nevertheless, the th what they want to say is that if you look carefully at political affairs, both ancient and modern, um, the military institutions of a state are always the most, um, they're the least stable, I should say. And this is precisely because this originary in, uh, volatility of the lack of functioning, specific organic function, um, of the war machine still insists um, even in the military institutions. So that this is why, for example, in modern states, there is always the, with unstable governments, there's always this risk of a military coup, for example, um, or the various sort of um, to and fro of power relations in modern states where 
where the where so, where the sovereignty of a particular part of the state is in question. So, I'll I'll throw a thesis at you here, and I think it's I think it's one they'd agree with, but I'd be wondering to see what you think. Where the way in which, actually, to back up a little bit, the war machine very bluntly precedes the state. Yeah, it's exterior to the state. I wouldn't. I'm I'm careful not to say that it precedes the state because it's not. It's not more original than the state. But we can say that the, the war machine plays a part in the construction of the state. Um, yes, insofar as it represents one of its formative functions, namely... Even if it war. operates as like a, a point of negation, or that thing that stands opposed to yes. it. Today, like, like you'd said, the, w the way that I would understand, or at least first reading this, thinking about the war machine, you know, you think of it, military industrial complex or like uh, forms of like neo-imperialism stuff mm -hmm. like that it seems to me then that precisely because the war machine does house something in the way that they describe it something of an indeterminacy there is an effort or a strategy employed by the state at least in the way we can see it manifest today that strives to uh, purge the war machine of that sort of indeterminacy in favor of mobilizing oh, yeah. it in war for the sake of war, yeah, giving it a face in mm -hmm. that way. But can the war machine as that indeterminate type figure ever be truly eradicated? And That's it, a good question. I mean, there's I don't no, know you, I don't have to, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> I, it's it's some, something that I was thinking about. We don't, we don't have to linger on that for too long if you don't want to. But it, um, Well, it seems to me that the sort of the polls... I, I mean, my, I would say no, not, n not once and for all. I mean, it might, you might, there might be a relatively um, placid period in, a, in the history of some particular state where the war machine doesn't pose any particular threat. That's yeah. to say the military institution is fully on board with the prerogatives of the state, etc. Um, but I don't think, because... You have to understand also that the war machine isn't tied to the institution either, right? Yeah. So it yeah. might be that, that that the state always needs to be on guard in relation to its military institutions precisely because of this threat, um, which is why, for example, I'm from the states, but this is why, for example, you know, there is separation of powers um, in, the in the U.S. Constitution. It's precisely because of the threat of the war machine. It's not because they think that... Um, the Senate is going to start a revolution. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they get nothing done anyway. <laughs> um, but anyway... Um, yeah, we don't have to labor on that, that too much. But, but I would say that um, if it... At least in our current situation, if, um, if something like the war machine were to pose a threat to the sovereignty of, of a state... At least in the Western First World, the the global North, if, you, if I think is a better term, maybe. But um, I would say it's not going to come from the military institution. It's going to come from elsewhere. That volatility is going to. So that's come interesting from because they also, when thinking about this thing called like primitive societies, mm -hmm. right? For them, they don't want to see it as being like something of a. They're being a like a telos, where it's like you you start out with the primitive societies for hunters and hunters and gatherers and it will inevitably lead to this thing called like organization of the state rather they see primitive societies as being counter states yeah or the thing that stands opposed so i'm um, i come to this from your suggestion that you know that sort of resistance to the state as we can see it manifest today would come from like outside yeah and i wonder what kind of role that would serve not only think about today and and you know to stay into the within the confines of this text how do they picture resistance in relation to like primitive societies? Yeah, this is another good state. question, um, and it's going to tie back into the thesis that they have about state formation and their critique of the developmental model, as you sort of alluded to. Um, <clears throat> so they're really taking from the work of uh, Pierre Clash, um in this case, who was a French anthropologist um, in the '60s and '70s. Um, and while most um, anthropologists of his con most of his contemporary anthropologists sort of tacitly assumed the thesis that 
um, primitive societies represented um, a state of production relative to the state formation in which they to use the Linguatri's sort of like ironic term that they quote unquote didn't understand how to organize themselves in a in a fully cooperative way in order to yeah. develop agriculture and produce surplus, yes, all this stuff, right? Um, and so that they were stuck in this um, these limited social formations uh, riven through with tribal conflict, um, such that they they couldn't ever so to speak, get themselves together to do it right. This is sort of the tacit assumption that most uh, anthropologists at the time had. And Pierre Closter wants to say, well, if you look carefully at, at um, how these societies are organized, um, sure, of course, you can always read it as like, oh, they just don't understand how to do it better. But you could also equally understand that there are many, many mechanisms in place in these societies which ensure that their societies stay in a certain way rather than um, leading toward um, producing state formations. So, for example, <clears throat> um, the small-scale but frequent um, tribal conflicts that are involved um, limit... <clears throat> their involvement, but also produce, um, so to speak, horizontal connections between tribes um, that ensure different kinds of marriage rights, um, while keeping the groups somewhat heteronymous, somewhat separate, somewhat isolated. And what this allows them to do is effectively ward off, in Pierre Clastra's, um estimation anyway, ward off the formation of larger scale um, organizations which might lead to the state. Now he's not claiming that they know that they're doing this, um, but what Deleuze and Guattari want to really radicalize is the idea that they are doing this um, <clears throat> and, that, and that what they're warding off is sort of like an eminent what they want to call an eminent threshold of consistency right, that yeah. inheres within the social formation itself um, in relation to the state. So and so they, so they give an account of um, the exchange networks that these kinds of societies have um, and show how um, a lot of the previous work that had been done in relation to this have mistaken those exchanges as um, as sort of like prototypical forms of gathering together um, the kinds of economic relations that would be required in a state formation. But they show how the actual estimation or the common value, because you have to remember that they're not using money, this is a direct barter situation between these um, societies, in which the common value is is itself the thing that wards off the formation of these larger scale organizations. So I I have a question, but before that, do you want to do you want to see this go anywhere else? Like, are you are you on like a certain train of thought? Well, we can keep going and show how this how eventually this re leads to the state as well. But because I I have a question that it, I think would be pretty simple to answer but it's con really confusing to me I'm not uh, so it, hopefully it'll be difficult for you and I, I have to read a passage for it and this is on page 429 of, of my version which I think is the same as yours here um, where they say that everything is not of the state precisely because there have, there have been states always and everywhere mm -hmm. what does that mean <laughs> how can everything e everything is not of the state but states have been always and everywhere right so, I mean, they're drawing on some very, at, at the time that they're writing this, very, very recent archaeological findings. Um, in particular, this, uh, um, um, a site in Anatolia called Chattelhuyuk. Um, but there have been more since they wrote this book. Um, and in particular, one that goes back even quite a ways further than the stuff that they were looking at. But, um, again, this has to do with 
the relationship to the developmental model that was sort of the consensus of the time about um, how the state represented um, a phase of social organization that was that represented progress in relation to its into in relation to former social formations. So what they want to say is that um, the developmental model doesn't work precisely because if you look at the archaeological record, the state goes back further and further and further. Yeah. The more we look, the farther Just back se- it goes. Seven thousand BC, so there are like. <laughs> um, and, it, and it goes BC. back to to the extent that it's no longer recognizable that yeah. agriculture preceded. Yeah. Um, the formation of the state, which is one of the sort of linchpins of the de- developmental model. Yeah, it's haunting, really. Yeah. Um, and this is true even to the extent that um, in some recent findings, uh, in particular uh, at a site called Gobekli Tepe, um, there, have, there have been what most people consider the cornerstones of, state, of a state apparatus, which is to say um, some form of public religion rather than ancestral religion. Um, that is to say, like a, a state religion, and um, and that also and mind. also large scale, um, large scale distributions of of um, of networks of trade and other things that you would associate with large cultural or political centers like a state might be like the emergence of a city but in but in the case of Gobekli Tepe they're they're strict hunter gatherers right they're not even like um in some transitional phase between foraging and and the in the partial domestication of animals um so i mean it it comes to confirm their thesis in in an even stronger way than they knew at the time in, in which they were writing this yeah um, so basically, what they're going to argue for is a is a little difficult to wrap your head around. Not because, of course, the state you know pushes back in time, but what they want to say is that because it's pushed back in time, it's not just a matter of it being older, but rather the whole problem changes, um, and it changes precisely because of the economic and social ramifications of that age. That that supposedly couldn't the state the state couldn't exist within this framework was was the other was the old hypothesis and what they want to say is actually the things that you're attesting to as the conditions of possibility of the state in some ways the state is the condition of the possibility for these other things to happen which is a haunting and somewhat depressing fact um, <laughs> <laughs> scratching my head. I, I'm going I'm to press you on that a little bit, not because I disagree, but I want to. I want to see what you mean by that. So, there, I think, like I totally agree that at the time, and I think even today, like there is a tendency to think like um, that the, the the state kind of emerged as a response to like like barbarity or as a response to like the discovering or the dis- government or whatever of the human as animal or the human as something other than what it can possibly be right. and then the state was that so, thing that developed so and, then, the, the, and then I know like, that's not it right right so um, I mean the poster boy for this usually is uh, is Thomas Hobbes of course yeah that, that was who, in the who has given an account of uh, what he calls the state of nature as opposed to the state proper, yeah, um, in which you know he calls life in the state of nature nasty, brutish, and short, and um, equated to a war of all against all. Um, and so, in the est- in the estimation of Thomas Hobbes, um, the power of violence is given over to the state. Um, in order that the violence doesn't become perpetual, right, 
Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in relation to every individual against every other individual. And we can already see here the sort of foggy traces of the war machine floating off in the distance. Um, but, you know, dimly viewed by Hobbes and misunderstood, misconstrued. Yeah, um, yeah. Because that power of violence is, of course, the power of the war machine, um, which is given, in quotes, given to the state. Yeah. Um, but this is, but this is the so-called the miracle of the state. Yeah. Is its power to assume the position in which it appears that everything is uh, authored by it, right? It, it it appears as if, and this is what they want to call magical capture in this chapter, right? It appears as if this is what they call in 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 an earlier work of theirs, uh, Anti Oedipus, the miraculating function of the state, because it appears miraculous that everything just flows forth from the state, fully formed. Um, and so their their goal in this chapter is to really de demystify that function and to show exactly how the state captures things and what that means for the things that it captures. So the state itself is not necessarily um, a moment in that it doesn't just it hasn't didn't just sprout up at a, a 3000, 7000 no. BC, right? Which isn't to say that it's like an eternal truth either. Obviously. No, 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 no. Yeah. It, like, there was something of a development of the state where the state itself obviously changed and developed over time. But one of the constitutive elements of it is precisely that ability to adapt, mm -hmm. but it's an ad adaptation that comes about through it, the yeah. apparatuses of capture. Yeah. Yeah, so I have. Hence a, the title of the, the plateau. Yes, yeah, so that is what they're going to presuppose and then try to work through. Um, and this is what they say about it. Um, so they say, thus in every case the war machine seems to intervene between the two poles of the state apparatus. These are the two poles that we mentioned before of the uh, <clears throat> magician emperor and the jurist priest um, since they have um, differentiated functions within the state apparatus itself. Um, so there needs to be some principle of relay between them. Um, and in many cases, through work of various authors that they cite um, in the early part of the book, they show how the war machine, besides being the organ um, of war for the state, also serves this purpose of relay. So the war machine seems to intervene between these two poles of the state apparatus, assuring and necessi necessitating the passage from one to the other. But then they say the following. We cannot, however, assign this schema a causal meaning, which is to say, we can't assign a fa the fact that either the state is, is the cause of the war machine because it needs this relay, or the other way around, the state proceeds, or the war machine precedes the state. Um, so they say, um, it, the war machine explains nothing in this case. Um, with relation to cause. And the second point is that if there is an evolution of the state, the second pole, the evolved pole, uh, must be in resonance with the first. It must continually recharge it in some way. Um, by which they mean, um, if there is a development of the state itself once it appears, it must have some relation to this, um, what they want to call the unity of composition of the state, um, in spite of all the differences in organization and development among different states over time and across space. Um, and so that, that unity of composition is the apparatus of capture. Um, so they want to say um, this interior essence uh, or this unity of the state is capture or the words magical capture describe the situation well. Um, but the question is, how is this capture to be explained then if it leads back to no distinct assignable cause, right? So no particular point in which the state emerges. 
um, even though when it whenever it appears, it appears fully formed. Um, and that's really the goal of the chapter, to describe this sort of, what they want to call the Urstadt. Right. The right, right, right. <laughs> so, that, that, that actually, if you can, like, elaborate on that, because in my very vulgar reading of it, I think just utopia in the most broad form, broad terms I could uh, attribute to that. But if you'd care to elaborate a little more on the yeah, Urstadt. Well, okay, so the Urstadt is... Um, it's this idea that there is a there's a structural I don't they might not use this word but there is a structural consistency to the form of the state which can take on extremely variable expressions um, so the constitution of the state can exist as um, the threshold of a primitive, so-called primitive, um, people, the thing to which their forms of um, exchange draw the limit so that they don't have to meet this threshold. Um, it can represent the form of the imperial state, um, which ushers in a regime of machinic enslavement. It can transform itself into um, the so a so-called developed state. Um, so, for example, in a regime of subjectification in relation to um, um, duty or contract, this would represent like a feudal regime or even something like an absolute monarchy as distinct from the despotic state or the, the regime of machinic enslavement, which is eminently public. So we have a distinction drawn there in terms of property. Um, but you could also draw the distinction um, in, relation, in the relation between, keep in mind this was during the Cold War, so in the relation between representative democratic states and socialist states as well and what they want to say is why do all of these things you know that is to say why does ancient Egypt um, why do the city-states of medieval Europe why do the nation-states of the 19th century and why do the socialist states of the 20th century why do all these things deserve the same name what what is common here yeah. right it's really as simple as that yeah and the tricky thing is to actually develop the thing that's common in a robust way and it involves variable relations between um populations and its use of populations um between its development and distribution of economic factors <clears throat> that is to say money um, and it's, um, it's apprehension of the earth. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. it's view of territories mm -hmm. or of land. Um, and in all three cases, um, populations in relation to labor, in relation to the economy, it's treatment of money and tax. And in relation to the earth, um, land, and property, it wants to develop this notion of capture. So, with the state, though, they lay out uh, other component, another component to it, and that is quite simply like the town. So mm -hmm. the relationship that the town has to the state. Yeah. And I have a I have a diagram. And I don't know, I can, it, I'd have to explain the diagram, where I have, uh, I think... put a picture up on the screen. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not at that level editing, I, I'm not at the, uh, my, the production I put into these videos is rather <laughs> poor. Sorry, I have to admit it. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll do it. Uh, but it's a, it's a rather simple diagram, where there are a series of S's that run vertically, 
or states, mm -hmm. and then horizontally from each of those S's are T's yes. or towns. Yeah. And then around each comes to denote something of a of a of a territory of a of a, of a nation. Uh, maybe if I was to jump a little bit, but how states work vertically in that way, towns horizontally across the states. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. So really, to jump right to my question, what role then? Because I, you brought up a good point. I hadn't thought of it that way, and I think it was probably one of the best ways to think about this, is how the state differs today, yet we still call you know, all these entities a state. What role does a thing like the town play in, in, in relation to that for Dulles and, and Guattari? Yeah, so the, um, they're very clear, um, and this g dovetails into their idea about um, what, they're, what they want to call thresholds of consistency which apply not just to the appearance of the state formation, but of all kinds of formations, social or otherwise. Um, and it, that, that would take us into a larger discussion about the conceptual work in A Thousand Plateaus in general. But, um, but they want to say, for example, on 432, uh, moreover, a distinction must be made between different thresholds of consistency. The town and the state, however complementary, uh, are not the same thing. The urban revolution and the state revolution may coincide, but do not meld. So this is a, another part, um, I think, that's invaluable in the methodology of Dules and Guattari, is they always want to get you to a certain place where you can assume a certain... Um, where it would be possible for you to assume a sort of monotonic view of the whole situation. And by monotonic, I mean that you could have, you could paint everything with the same brush. So you're like, okay, the state, it's like the enemy par excellence. Yeah. Like everything that's wrong with society is because of the state. Yeah, right? or you have some other broad category like, <clears throat> like capitalism. Sure. Like, whoa, what is and that? Then, and then they, they'll get you to the point by fleshing out in detail certain parts of their argument um, and but then they always want to draw you back and say, even in cases when you're thinking about something that might be disastrous in the course of human affairs, it's always important to understand the role that multiplicity rather than monotony plays in anything. So, with with regard to this, and of course with the town, I mean you know what. You might say, like, oh, what bad things could we say about the town in particular? That seems like a fairly uh, innocuous formation. And, of course, they're not, they're not here to demonize the state or the town in, in and of themselves. But the whole point is this, um, that in the course of, of the formation of, of the most important things in human history... Um, it's always important to see in which ways certain continued formations happen in a particular instance so that they come together to form things in the way that they do, right? Um, so it's not a matter of, yes, in some sense there is um, this enduring notion of what a state is, which is typified not by its, um, not by some particular, particularly determinative political organization, you know, it's not determined by oligarchy or by democracy or any of the sort of formative classical determinations we might make about political states, but rather it's about the way that, um, the sort of operations it can perform, and in particular, its hegemony uh, only came as a consequence of the emergence, the contemporaneous emergence of other formations um, in which um, in which compatible resonances um, came together in a contingent way. So in this case, the state and the town, like the urban revolution and the state revolution came together at the right time. Yeah, and they, they right. 
um, they feed off of one another in a certain way, whereas the state being that thing that sort of organizes or surrounds, at least in part, this, these things called the towns, they affirm one another or their respective positions in relation to one another and operate as a sort of circuit in that way or a mm-hmm. network. Yeah. Now, ne- networks is a pretty uh, key term in this in this as well. Definitely. Like being that thing that connects in, yeah. in, in part or that Yeah, highway. so to be less abstract, um, what the town does in relation to um, this other threshold of consistency is that it operates, as you said, um, as a circuit, as a relay um, for goods and people, basically. Yeah. Um, as they say, the town is the correlate of the road. So the, the road sort of makes possible the town as such, because the town, the town gains its consistency from um, the flow of of goods and people um, and without that it's no it's no longer a town it isn't what it is so if you think about if you even if you look at small towns in I'm assuming Canada but definitely in the states um, there are always these points where it's very clear when you're entering a town and when you're exiting one right um, and this is because the the transit of things through a town is what makes the town possible for them. And it's also what feeds back into um, the economic development of the state um, for various reasons. Um, one of them being as a, an effective means of um, of local extraction and then as a as a relay point um, for, in the primitive state, you might say for rent, for ground rent or taxation, things like this. But there are, there are also nodes in which the other social formations, which are not proper to the state, come in contact with the state as well, right? So this is where you get the itinerant farmers that aren't part of the state, um, providing some lifeblood to the state, you get, um, I don't know, occasionally probably some nomadic herders or something coming through, um, as well as distant trade networks that find their way, um, at least that find nodes in the towns um, and through the towns to the state. Um, so this is part of their argument about how the primitive people, primitive peoples and the state organization could function contemporaneously as well as them being exterior to one another and not, and not in the same way in which you might think, oh, okay, well, the primitive peoples are dependent on the state or the state is dependent on the primitive. Not like that, but in a model in which very many social factors which are exterior to one another nevertheless coexist and in that way can't be thought of as separable without them becoming homogenous or isomorphic or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's, that, was a, that was a good answer. Maybe a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, but we'll, we'll cut this off there because... Uh, you know, there are a ton of other things we could, we could talk about. Getting into, like, you know, what is this? Becoming minoritarian talk is just one possible avenue. Uh, but for now, we're going to cut this one off, and we'll take this up another time. But for those that made it this far, like, I'd be um, curious to see what other people think. And uh, if anyone has any beef with either Curtis or I, there's a comment section for a reason. Please take advantage of it. But for now, for anyone that made it this far, thanks for listening. Thanks. And, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll see Curtis here again. I, I'm 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 positive, but uh, yeah, thanks a lot.